Good morning. Again, I mean, I feel like I've been talking to you all morning, but I'll say good morning again. I'm just, I'm just so grateful to be here with you. I'm so grateful that you're joining us online as we continue this series that we are calling Bill, or Better, well, like I know what it's called, Better Together. Because we've all made, have, we've all been called to follow Jesus, right? That is our calling. That is what we are, are pressed to do and to make him the Lord of our lives and to spread his gospel to each and every person around us. And when it comes to giving our best selves to his work and doing what he wants us to do, it's just better that we do that together. See, we were created not to live life alone in a vacuum, but we were created to live life together, sharing in this mission to continue Jesus' work of reconciling the world back to God. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, as a church, I mean, that's our mission. That's what drives us. We, we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to do what Jesus left us to do, and that is to continue his work reconciling the world around us. And last week, Jim kicked off the series by talking about the idea that discovering our gifts are done, are better done together. And we walked through the word acrostic, or the word art as an acrostic, right? The A stands for, if you remember, that A stands for abilities. The R stands for resources, yep. And T is a cheat. It stands for the Holy Spirit, yeah. Abilities, resources, and the Holy Spirit have been given to us as ways that we have been gifted to join Jesus' mission through the church. And we have the opportunity to come together to help each other discover our gifts and to work together toward that mission. And this morning, as we continue, I can't help but bring up, because, because I, I'm also handling the student ministries, that we're having our trip next weekend to Shaw Farm. Because going to a pumpkin farm this, type of year, this kind of year is a must. Like, you have to go to a pumpkin farm, or else you have not adequately celebrated the autumn season. And while we're there, we'll be treating everyone to do the corn maze. You have to do the corn maze, right? You got to go to the pumpkin farm. You have to do a corn maze. Well, well, not necessarily. I mean, we're going to. It's going to be fun, but I'm not a big fan. I don't like corn mazes. I just don't like the idea of willingly walking into a situation where I know I'm going to be lost. Has anybody ever done like a breakout room, like one of those like clue things? Yeah, I've never done that. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm pro we're probably going to do that later on in the year too, but I'm just to walk into something and just be incredibly lost the moment I get in. I just, I don't like the idea of that. Because all too often I see a corn maze as like a big metaphor for life. Like there are forks in the road, there are right choices, and there are wrong choices. There's a high probability that you're going to be lost at some point or in multiple points throughout the maze you're going to be lost. And just like life, I don't know, there's a lot of corn. I guess there's a lot of corn around us. What, anyway, you start the journey, right? And you are instantly met with choices. It doesn't take you long to walk in before you're met with a choice. Do I go this way or do I go that way? What are the things that I need to avoid as I travel through this maze? And what do I need to keep in mind as I walk the maze? Are there resources that can help me navigate the maze? Are there people that have gone before me that maybe I could talk to? And life is like that, isn't it? Life is like a, a continual maze that we try to navigate, hoping not to run into any dead ends and just looking to make it to the other side. And what we're talking about this morning is just that, being able to navigate life as a series of choices. And in order to do that, we must develop what is commonly referred to as discernment discernment now as simply as possible discernment is the possession of wisdom that allows us to understand what is right and what is wrong of what is the truth and what are lies to be able to understand what's good and what's evil to discern something means that we can understand the difference between a couple options, even if those options are very hard to differentiate 
from each other. I don't know about you, but I see this come up a lot in my personal life. I don't know about you, but do you find yourself asking, man, what, what choice does God want me to make right here? I have this option and I have this option. What does God want me to do? What does God want me to choose? Or even more, like, I, I see this, I see this thing or that thing, and it is being widely praised by everybody. But man, I'm just not sure if that's what God wants. I don't know if that's what God wants for me. Especially when it comes to, to, to balancing out good and evil. Man, there's so much pressure to be able to rightly identify which is which. Because a lot, of, a lot of times, the things that used to be celebrated as good are now seen as evil. And then vice versa, the things that we consider to be evil are now celebrated as good. What a world. <laughs> How can I know? And on top of that, which, which voice am I going to listen to? Man, there's so many voices around us now that call us to different things. So as I pick things out and I, and I try to find these voices and identify them, which one's God's voice? How do I know if that's the one I need to follow? How, how do I know that that's actually what God wants me to do? And so, so many times in, in different areas of our life, we stand at a crossroads. Like someone lost in a corn maze just trying to avoid the wrong, the wrong way, trying to avoid that dead end. We want to honor God by, by making choices that are not just best for us, but also choices that glorify Him and make His kingdom known and make His righteousness known. That's what we're called to do. So we need discernment. Because discernment is that valuable skill that helps us navigate the world in which we live. So, how do we get discernment? How do we get it? It's first vitally important to remember, as we talked about last week, that discernment is given to us by that gift that God has given us, the gift of all gifts called the Holy Spirit. That we actually have an advocate who, if we will allow him, will help guide us through difficult choices and forks in the road. We have this amazing, powerful gift called God's very presence living in us in the Holy Spirit. And you just, you just have to take a second in all the cloudiness and the murkiness of life just to thank God that in his generosity, he gave us himself so that we wouldn't have to deal with this stuff alone. I'm grateful. So if we believe that those who follow Jesus, those who have been baptized in his name and consider themselves a disciple of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. If we have discernment, how do we tap into the wisdom to make the right choices? How do we do that? Thankfully, and everything basically boils down to the point, we worship Jesus who did two things for us. He embodied discernment which means he gave us an example of discernment. And he also took time to clearly explain what it meant to live a life of discernment. So where do we see Jesus practice discernment? Where do we see him exemplify it? In the Gospels, when Jesus begins his ministry, and immediately as he's, as he's baptized by John, Immediately we see in the Gospels that he is led into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. And while in the wilderness and he's feeling the pains of hunger in his fasting, here comes a voice. Here comes a voice. Hey, if, if you're so hungry, then why don't you just tell the stone to become bread and eat it? Then the devil comes back and he tempts Jesus with this sense of, of fame. Hey, if you're the son of man... Why don't you go up to the temple and drop yourself off the highest point and then command your legion of armies to come and swoop you up and save you in that moment. Man, that would have been such a spectacle to see. Then he tempts Jesus with this idea of being the king of the world. He says, I will give you all the kingdoms on earth if you bow down and worship me. That voice is continuously in Jesus' mind. The devil is tempting him to make a choice. 
And with each temptation, with each choice that Jesus is given that seems irresistible, what does he do? He counters the voice of the devil with the voice of his father. Each and every time he quotes the scriptures back to the devil until the temptation was gone. Now see, that's one example of, of, of Jesus embodying discernment. And it's why we love Jesus, because he shows us that, hey, ultimately, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, the words of scripture will always guide the light forward for all of our actions that we have an amazing resource called God's Word that we think is that a lot of people will say it's not relevant today. Oh, it is relevant today. It speaks to anything that we are going through. So we have God's Word. We have the voice of God on our side. And secondly, as it says in Hebrews 14, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet, he did not sin. We worship a God who doesn't just tell us, hey, you need to, you need to follow good and avoid evil. We have a God who actually came down and met us at the choices that we make. That he actually heard the voice of the devil and the voice of his father, and he made a choice. We have a, a God that is unlike any other God, and that he came down and experienced that temptation with us. So here Jesus shows what discernment looks like. But also, if you turn with me to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, Jesus tells us what discernment is. And as you turn to John chapter 10, it's going to be up on the, on the board as well, but if you want to turn and follow along, as you turn there, I just want to fully emphasize what we're about to read. It's about 18 verses. Because you've heard this imagery before, most of you, but this is the essence of what it means to follow Jesus. What Jesus is about to tell us is exactly what it means to follow him. And if you have heard nothing to this point, I want to implore you to please listen now. Jesus has just ticked off the Pharisees again. And again, Pharisees are those who were the teachers of the law of Moses. And he often ticked them off. He didn't like them very much because they were extremely arrogant in their knowledge. And they held others to the law that they themselves violated. They didn't judge themselves. They judged other people way more than they judge themselves. And Jesus had just healed a man of his blindness, and it happened to be on the Sabbath day of rest. And the Pharisees interrogated this man who was healed, and after not liking the replies he was given, and they, they kicked the man out of the synagogue. And so once he's kicked out of the synagogue, he goes and rejoins Jesus, who then uses that moment to call the Pharisees spiritually blind. He then tells them this parable in John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. 
The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. I want to break this down, but what Jesus really, I mean, we just read 18 verses, but really what Jesus is saying here is something he says in one sentence a few chapters later. You've probably heard it. John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the gate through which we enter. Jesus is the path on which we walk. And Jesus is the shepherd that, will f- that we follow into good pastures. Jesus is the truth. He is the voice that we live our lives listening for. Now, we're going to talk more about that next week. But he is the knowledge of good and evil. He is the knowledge of right and wrong. He is the knowledge of the good path and the bad path. Jesus is the life. He is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. He's the one who lays down his life for us. He was the one who was willing to lay down his life and then take it up again in resurrection for us. He is the one who brings in more sheep into the field who hear and decide to follow his voice. He is the protector and he is the giver of life. Jesus is our source of discernment. Everything revolves around the mighty, glorious, wonderful name of Jesus. And Jesus is our discernment. He is our focus for every single decision, every single choice we make in this life. And you know, being described as a sheep is is not something that's very flattering in this day and age. But when it comes to, hey... If I don't have to try to navigate this life alone and and I'm left to my own vices and my limited knowledge of everything to try to make a choice, but when it comes to say, I can follow this shepherd who leads us to all things good for us, then I will bat like the rest of the sheep that are out there because Jesus is where everything should begin. It's where everything continues and flows through and it's where everything ends for our lives. See, as Christians, we're a people of movement. We're not stagnant. We don't stay still. We are a people of movement, following Jesus, again, who is reconciling the world to himself and leading us into the gate of his kingdom. So when we follow Jesus, we follow his voice to the gate. Every action, every choice we make in our lives must be in tune to this, has to be in tune to this. Where Jesus goes, we go. And how do we do this? How do we actively follow Jesus' actions and his words? We've got to make it a priority to spend time with him one-on-one in the disciplines. As Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and he was able to, to hold the voice of God against the voice of the devil. You see, when we understand God's voice, when we continuously, we, we understand his voice when we continually go into scripture and devotion. When we live a life that's full of prayer, where we bring to him our cares and our worries and our praises, but we also take time to listen in the stillness and the quiet for his voice. 
Because when we lament the choices that come into our lives, we do it because we, we, we ultimately, in the end, we want to make the choice that's best for us. It's usually our selfishness that comes into play with what we want to do. And we take little to no consideration to what brings glory and honor to Jesus and the growth of his kingdom. Especially when we talk about knowing to identify and choose between what is right and what is wrong. Our values at FCC reflect this importance. Man, Scripture is where everything is founded and laid. Biblical authority is important for the ability for the church to discern what is taught and what is decided. And when the church holds that up as a value that's detrimental to the life of the church at large, then so should we as individual members of this church, individually following Jesus and as members of the big C church around the world. We've got to hold that a priority. If we want to obtain the discernment necessary to make critical choices in our lives and to understand what is of God and what's of the world, what's darkness and what's light, we have to always focus our minds and our hearts on our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. We've got to follow him in everything we do. But the point still stands this morning that we are better together at developing discernment. We are better together at developing discernment. We need to labor together as a family to help each other learn to grow and to make choices in our lives that reflect the kingdom as our priority. We need to work together. One person that knew this was Paul. And as we continue to look through the book of 2 Timothy this month, we focus our attention to chapter 2 of 2 Timothy to find out why why is it so important to help each other and encourage each other to seek Jesus for discernment. You see, Paul's story, he encountered the risen Jesus in the most intimate way, a way that changed his very identity from a, a ruthless persecutor of Christians into a believer himself. And when when Paul was called by Jesus to bring this good news of the death and resurrection to those people outside of the Jewish faith, Paul relied heavily on the grace and the guidance of Jesus. And when Paul went around and planted churches, he also brought up young leaders with him who would take the lead of those churches, including a young man named Timothy, learning from Paul and, and was emerging as a leader himself. And in chapter 2, Paul gives Timothy, and he gives us, an idea of what it means to pass along this wisdom of discernment. Here's how it reads, 2 Timothy 2, starting at verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. See, Paul has valuable experience in discernment, making choices in his own life and growing in his understanding and the knowledge of good and evil. Paul has been through the maze. Paul is continuously going through the maze, but he's a lot farther than Timothy is now. And Paul tells Timothy first, first, before anything, be strong in the grace of Christ. In other words, continually put yourself in the presence of Jesus and grow your relationship with him. And also, the things that you heard me say to others, I want you to take that. I want you to take those words, I want you to take those experiences, and I want you to pass them on to other reliable people who will then take them on to teach others. You see, when they were planning churches, they were better together because they were passing along not just, not just information, but they were passing along discernment and wisdom. And then jumping down to verse 8. Paul gives Timothy the reminder that we talked about just now and the reminder that we need to come together and remind each other that we must practice discernment. The first three words, remember Jesus Christ. Raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel for which I'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal 
but God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Paul's ultimate guidance for Timothy as he led the church was to remember Jesus Christ, was to remember who Jesus is and what he's done. When we help each other with discernment of making good choices in our lives, our goal is to help each other remember Jesus Christ. And as the family of God grows in the local church, the wealth of wisdom that is obtained by other experiences, that grows as well. That experience of, of good choices, the experience of the repercussions of making a bad choice, of times spent in the darkness, and then times when the light was revealed, those are all evidence of the Spirit working in our lives. And these testimonies help others going through the same thing. And they help them develop their discernment. So how do we help each other remember Jesus Christ? We help each other recognize the shepherd's gate. When we help people, when we help each other recognize or remember Jesus Christ, we help them recognize the shepherd's gate. We have a broad kingdom view in mind, not just of the work in the kingdom that is going on right now, but a reminder of where we are in movement to. Remember, we're a people of movement. We're following the good shepherd toward the gate of the eternal kingdom. We need to continuously remind each other with all the choices we're making in our life, are we taking a step toward the gate or are we wandering off? We help each other recognize the shepherd's voice. In other words, we help point each other to the truth of Scripture. We help point each other to Jesus' voice so, and, and, and be able to ask the question, what is the truth in the blurriness of our lives around us? We help each other recognize the shepherd's gift. In other words, we remind each other of the life Jesus gave to us by dying on a cross and his immense power to take it up again in resurrection. And just as important as all that, we also must be graceful and we need to be forgiving to each other. Because the truth is, we're not going to be perfect in our discernment, are we? I mean, we, try to, we try to bullet point this out and say, you want to make good choices? This is what you need to do. But you know what? A lot of us, including myself, are going to leave and go make a choice that's not to the kingdom and not to the righteousness of Jesus. At some point, we are going to make a wrong decision. At some point, we are going to leave and we are going to go ahead and choose darkness over light. We are going to exchange the truth of God for a lie. We're going to do it because we're imperfect, because we fall short. And we are going to mess it up. And when those times come, I want to reassure you that God is present with you. God is present with you when you make the good choice. God is present with you when you win the bad ones. God doesn't leave you when you mess up. He doesn't leave when you mess it up. That same good shepherd who leads his faithful flock of sheep in the green pastures is also the one who is willing to leave the 99 temporarily to go find the one who was astray and bring him back. That's the God we serve. So if you sit here now wondering, man, I'm looking back at the choices I made in my life and, and, and maybe you're wondering if the choices you made have kept God away from you, please know that God has never left you. He has never forsaken you. In fact, that's what the church is for, to remind each other of that fact. He's never left you. He's always been with you. We don't give up on each other. 
because Jesus never gave up on us. So this morning, as, as we have the worship team come up and we, we kind of transition to a closing, I just want to ask a few questions.